So this morning we're going to be in Ruth chapter 2, so if you have your Bibles, go ahead and grab them. If you don't have a Bible, there should be a hardback black one really close to you in the pew there. So go ahead and turn there. Ruth is the eighth book of the Bible, so stay towards the front. And while you're turning there, uh, what I want to do is do a little bit of review. So this is the third week in our Ruth series. So in the first week, uh, Derek introduced this as an epic story. And then every epic story has an epic beginning. So the epic beginning of this story is in the days when the judges ruled. Now, that sentence carries a lot of context for the people of Israel. Not so much for us, but really for the people of Israel. The days when the judges ruled was a time when they had just come into the promised land. um, And they they had been there in this land that God had promised them. And they get into this cycle of sin and rebellion, judgment and consequence, and really repentance and deliverance. And they're in this vicious cycle that they can't get out of. And so we come to this story in a town of Bethlehem in the midst of a famine, which is part of the consequence that God had laid on his people. And we meet a man named Elimelech, who has a a wife named Naomi, the two sons, Malon and Kilion. And Elimelech says, well, there's a famine. I can fix that. I'm going to take my family and I'm going to move to Moab. I'm going to leave the community of God's people. I'm going to leave the promised land and I'm going to go take care of this on my own. And what we see from scripture is that goes really poorly. They're there for about 10 years. During the course of the 10 years, Elimelech dies. His sons marry Moabite wives. They intermarry. And then his sons both die. At the end of the 10 years, we have three women, Naomi and her two daughters-in-law, Orpah and Ruth, and their worlds really have been shaken. And so we get into chapter 2, and Naomi hears that, sorry, into the the second week, and Naomi hears that the Lord has visited his people in Bethlehem, and there is a harvest coming in. And so she decides to go back to Bethlehem. And what she does, she tells her two daughters-in-law, hey, you need to stay here. You shouldn't come with me. There is nothing in that direction for you. Stay here with the people you know and the land that you know. There is no hope for a future if you come with me. And we see two different responses. We see Orpah kisses Ruth, or kisses Naomi, and goes back. Back to her pagan gods, back to where it was comfortable. And we see Ruth, and she clings to Naomi. And she comes back with her to Bethlehem. We've also set this story up as a Cinderella story. And I think there are definitely some similarities between Ruth and Cinderella. You see, both of them were in a bad situation. Both of them were really out of place. And both of them took action to do something about their situation. But see, I think the motivation was different. See, Cinderella had much to gain by going to the ball. Right? There was fancy clothes. There was probably some good food. There was a prince. There was really hope of a future as Cinderella took action. But with Ruth, there's nothing. She is going into a land she doesn't know, to a people she doesn't know. And Naomi has made it very clear that there is no hope for you. There's no husband. There's no family. There's nothing. If you come with me, you're leaving everything behind. And so we see that that Ruth is not driven by happily ever after. She's driven by something much more powerful. She's driven by the chesed of Yahweh, her God. So what's chesed? Well, chesed is a Hebrew word, oftentimes translated steadfast love or loving kindness or just kindness. There's really no good English equivalent for this word. One of the best definitions I've seen is from the Jesus Storybook Bible. And the Jesus Story, I have kids, so we read the Jesus Storybook Bible. It's awesome. Um, But the definition they really have for this is the never stopping, never giving up, unbreaking, always and forever love of God. This is God's faithful love. And we see this is what's driving Ruth to cling to Naomi and come to a land that she doesn't know. To a people she doesn't know with really no hope for her future. But driven by the love of God for her, this faithful love, she does it anyway. And so the, the worlds of these two women have been shaken. But they come back into Bethlehem, and we see there's a glimmer of hope. Because as we look in the end of the first chapter, they come to Bethlehem at the end of the barley harvest. And that's where we pick up the story. So we're going to go to Ruth chapter 2. Would you stand with me in honor of God's word? Now Naomi had a relative of her husband's, a worthy man of the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, Let me go to the field and glean among the ears of grain after him, in whose sight I shall find favor. And she said to her, Go, my daughter. So she set out and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the clan of Elimelech. And behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem. And he said to the reapers, The Lord be with you. 
And they answered, The Lord bless you. Then Boaz said to his young man who was in charge of the reapers, Whose young woman is this? And the servant who was in charge of the reapers answered, She is the young Moabite woman who came back with Naomi from the country of Moab. She said, Please let me glean and gather among the sheaves after the reapers. So she came and she has continued from early morning until now, except for a short rest. Then Boaz said to Ruth, Now listen, my daughter, do not go to another, do not go glean in another field, or leave this one, but keep close to my young women. Let your eyes be on the field that they are reaping and go after them. Have I not charged the young men not to touch you? And when you are thirsty, go to the vessels and drink what the young men have drawn. Then she fell on her face, bowing to the ground, and she said to him, Why have I found favor in your eyes that you should take notice of me, since I am a foreigner? But Boaz answered her, All that you have done for your mother-in-law since since the death of your husband has been fully told to me, and how you left your father and mother in your native land and came to a people that you did not know before. The Lord repay you for what you have done, and a full reward be given you by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Then she said, I have found favor in your eyes, my Lord, for you have comforted me and spoken kindly to your servant, though I am not one of your servants. And at mealtime, Boaz said to her, come here and eat some bread and dip your morsel in the wine. So she sat beside the reapers and he passed to her roasted grain and she ate until she was satisfied and she had some left over. When she rose to glean, Boaz instructed his young men saying, let her glean even among the sheaves and do not reproach her. And also pull out some from the bundles for her, and, for her and leave it for her to glean and do not rebuke her. So she gleaned in the field until evening. And then she beat out what she had gleaned and it was about an ephah of barley. And she took it up and went into the city. Her mother-in-law saw what she had gleaned. She had also brought out and gave her what food she had left over after being satisfied. And her mother-in-law said to her, where did you glean today and where have you worked? Blessed be the man who took notice of you. So she told her mother-in-law with whom she had worked and said, the man's name with whom I work today is Boaz. And Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, May he be blessed by the Lord, whose kindness has not forsaken the living or the dead. Naomi also said to her, The man is a close relative of ours, one of our redeemers. And Ruth the Moabite said, Besides, he said to me, You shall keep close by my young men until they have finished all my harvest. And Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, It is good, my daughter, that you go out with his young women, lest in another field you be assaulted. So she kept close to the young women of Boaz, gleaning until the end of the barley and wheat harvest. And she lived with her mother-in-law. Let's pray. God, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for the story of Ruth, and we thank you for the example that it is to us today. God, pray that you would give us eyes to see, you would give us ears to hear, and you would give us hearts to accept uh, the word that you have for us today. And God, I ask that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. You're seated. Um, one of the things I like to do is kind of take a look back at my life and reflect on how I got from point A to point B to point C as I went along this journey. So I thought I'd share with you a little bit this morning um, about how I got to Naperville. Um, I came to Naperville from Indiana via California, which really isn't the normal route, right? You go up 65 and come across 80, that's how you get here. But uh, I came via California. So how did all that happen? Well, I went to a college at a small engineering school in Terre Haute, Indiana, Um, which is where I met my beautiful wife, who's sitting over here. I met my beautiful wife there, um, and we began to date. Um, She was a year older than me, and her senior year, we got engaged. And then she took a job, she graduated, took a job in the one place I said I never wanted to live, California. And so I had little choice in the matter. So uh, when I I knew that she was out there, she was established in her job, so so I knew that I was going to have a very limited area to go and look for a job in as I graduated. Um, So I began to interview for positions. I began to send a lot of resumes out. And through that process, I got offered one job. And I took that job, and I moved to California. So one of my primary goals when I moved to California was to figure out a way to get back to the Midwest. Um, Nothing nothing against California. I'm I'm just a Midwest guy. So um, so it took about six years. But uh, six years later, I was really came to a place where I was unhappy in the job that I was in um, and began to, to look around. Um, and my wife and I had decided that we did want to move back this way. So I started looking really in the Chicago area, um, which got us, you know, close to family, but, but not too close. Um, so, so we moved back to the Chicago area. And during that time, we had met um, a couple at our church who had once lived in Naperville. Um, So we thought, hey, uh, we'd heard a lot about it, so we kind of targeted this area. So I began to look for a job in this area, sent out lots of resumes, did lots of things. And then one day I was speaking to a man at the church we were attending, and he said, hey, I hear you're looking for a job. 
and I know what kind of work you do, and I need somebody who does that kind of work. I said, well, that's great. Problem is, I want to move back to the Chicago area. He said, that's great. I need somebody in the Chicago area. So I got offered one job, and I took that job, and it brought us ultimately back to Naperville. And so as I look back and reflect on that story, I, I, can, I can look back and I can say, man, I was really lucky. Man, I was just in the right place at the right time. Everything just kind of fell into line. I can look back and I, and I can say that. Or I can look back and know that there's a God who loves me, who's been directing my story from the very beginning and moving me from point A to point B to point C in the way that he wanted me to go. Not in the way that I would have scripted it, but in the way that he wanted me to go with the experiences that he wanted me to have. And so he brought me here and ultimately up here. And so I stand here this morning, really just, I'm just trying to be faithful to where, the God, where God is leading me in my life. And so why do I tell you that story? What relevance does that have? Well, if we look in chapter 2 of Ruth here, we see that there are two people, the two main characters, Ruth and Boaz, who really are people who have recognized God is directing their story and they're trying to stand faithful in the midst of that. Um, one of the things that Hebrew writers um, will oftentimes do is instead of explaining the character of a person to you with words, they will show you through the example of their life. And so here in Ruth, we see that happen. Um, there are two people on separate journeys who God brings together ultimately for his glory and to develop the royal line of the Messiah, of Jesus Christ. And so these two people are shining examples of the kind of faithfulness that we as Christians should have. They're people we should pattern our lives after. So let's go ahead and jump in. We'll start with Ruth. Now in Ruth chapter 2, we, we get a greater picture of her character. She really rolls up her sleeves and dives right into the situation that she's in. In Ruth, we see a woman who is on mission with God, filled with initiative, humility, and determination. So first, her initiative. So Ruth is really concerned. She's been moved by Jesus, by this love of God for her. And she has, care, she has compassion on Naomi. And she wants to care for her and provide for her. And so she's moved into action. You see, faithfulness should never be confused with, with lazily waiting around for God to speak. So Ruth takes action. You see, God is moving. And Jesus is on mission. And Ruth is a very good example of seeing someone move along with him on that mission. They had come back to Bethlehem, but they had nothing. And they came back really in two states of mind. Naomi is kind of full of bitterness. But Ruth has been transformed by Yahweh, by God. She's been freed up to live a life without herself, to live a selfless life full of sacrificial love for others. She's been freed to die to herself, to leave that behind her. She's been freed not only to commit, but to act. And she was bold in her commitment to Ruth, or to Naomi. She was bold in her commitment to Naomi, and then she was faithful to act. Now, she could have come back and just sat there, right? She could have come back, and she could have looked for a man to marry. She could have taken a very woe-is-me approach to this whole thing, but that's not what she does. You see, that's not Ruth. She takes action. And so in verse 2, we see that she requests permission to go and glean in the fields. So what's gleaning? Well, gleaning was a process that was commanded by the Lord in his law. You can look in Leviticus chapter 19, uh, verses 9 and 10, in chapter 23, verse 22, and then in Deuteronomy 24, 21. So it's, it's really sprinkled all over the place. Um, so God had developed this process in his law whereby when you harvested your field, you were to leave the edges and the corners for the poor, for the foreigner, for the traveler, so that even those with nothing, if they had the initiative, they could have food to eat. And Ruth has this initiative. But she also has the love and respect for Naomi to ask permission. And she never questions the fact that Naomi doesn't offer to go with her. Right? Naomi's probably in her 40s or 50s. Naomi, perfectly capable of going out into the fields with Ruth and gleaning. Probably could have been a real big help to her. Probably could have shown her the ropes, introduced her to some people, say, go to this field, don't go to that field. Probably could have been a big help. But see, Naomi has been crushed by her circumstances. She's been paralyzed. She is frozen in place. Because all she can see is the bitterness. But Ruth is moved. 
Ruth takes action. She is moved by the love of God for her and lives her life with an open hand, giving control to him. And so ultimately, we're going to see the love of God break through Ruth into Naomi and bust that bitterness up. And so she, she asks permission to go to the field to pick up scraps just so they can eat. And, and Naomi kind of, kind of lifelessly says, go, my daughter. The, the picture I get of Naomi in this moment is her sitting at the kitchen table, kind of staring out the window, kind of out of it, sipping her morning coffee. And, and she's just like, go, my daughter. Like, I don't even know if she really hears Ruth, maybe, but there's just, there's just nothing left in her. right? She's just consumed by the bitterness of her circumstances. She has been shaken. But we see Ruth, faithful in her commitment to Naomi, faithful in her initiative, and she gets to work. You see, she was faithful in her initiative because of God's faithful love. And so Ruth goes. She goes out into a land she doesn't know, among a people she doesn't know, into a danger she probably doesn't understand. And she just so happens, wink, wink, to come to the field of Boaz. Now, the interesting thing about this phrase is it could also be translated as luck would have it, she chanced upon the field of Boaz. And so what we get here is kind of a little bit of Hebrew sarcasm. As the author allows us to realize that Proverbs 16, 9, which says the heart of a man plans his way, but it's the Lord who directs his steps, is actually a reality. And so she, she takes action, she goes to the field, and then once again she requests permission she doesn't assume anything. She doesn't assume she's entitled to this grain. She doesn't do that. She asks permission. She humbly asks permission, and then she works hard. This is the process of harvesting in those days. You had a group of men, the reapers, that would go through, and they would chop down the stalks. And then a group of women would come behind them, and they would gather the stalks together and put them in bundles. Ruth would have done both. But she does it. She does it without complaint, she does it without grumbling. This is not the fun part of the journey for Ruth. But what we see in her response is humility. We see her humility as she asks permission. And we see humility even in her response when Boaz, when Boaz engages her. Boaz comes up. We see Boaz in verse 8 and 9, he commands her. In verse 12, he blesses her. And we see, we see this humility in her response. I'm not even one of your servants. Why would you do this to me? Why would you do this for me? See, the response we don't get from Ruth is, of course the Lord should bless me. Do you see how hard I'm working? Do you see this sweat? See, this is real sweat. That's not the response we get from Ruth. She really can't respond that way. She's died to herself and she's driven by the faithful love of God, which guides her, which drives her, which gives her the humility. So there's no self-promotion in this woman. There's only great humility. You see, she was faithful and her humility because of God's faithful love. And finally, we see the determination of Ruth. So she comes home. She, she, through her hard work throughout this day and through the favor of the Lord, through Boaz, she has gleaned an ephah of barley. What the heck does that mean? Well, that was equi- would be equivalent to about 30 to 35 pounds of barley in one day by one woman. Gleaning. That's a pretty big haul for one woman in one day. And so you would have to ask, did the Lord bless her because of her faithfulness? I would say yes. He blessed her with a 12-hour day, picking up scraps just so she could eat. That doesn't sound like much of a blessing to me, but a great blessing to her who has relinquished control of her life to the Lord, driven by his faithful love for her. And so the Lord continues to provide through Boaz for her for the next six or seven weeks of the barley harvest. And we get no complaint. She just goes to work. You see, she was faithful in her determination because of God's faithful love. And so we have Ruth, a woman who is faithful, once again, in her initiative, in her humility, in her determination. But this story isn't just about Ruth, right? In chapter 1, we meet a man named Boaz, a worthy man named Boaz. And worthy carries a lot, that word carries a lot with it. See, he was a wealthy man. We know because he's got field, he's got workers. 
Right? He was a prominent man in the community. We'll find that out later on in chapter 3 and chapter 4. He was well-respected, well-thought of, and above all, he was a godly man. In, in a time when people weren't being faithful, Boaz was faithful. And he also has a great entrance. Right? In, in verse 4, we see, Behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem. I think this is a fantastic entrance. I think if anybody, just so you know, if anybody writes a book about me or does a movie or anything like that, not that I'm saying that would happen, I want at least one scene that introduces me like this. And behold, John. I think, I think that would be awesome. Seriously. I think that would be awesome. But in Boaz, we find a man who is faithful in his obedience, in his kindness, and in his generosity. And first, obedience. So you see, Boaz has stood faithful. We, we can take Boaz's faithfulness, and we can trace that back further than just chapter 2. Right? Boaz lives in Bethlehem. He lives in the same Bethlehem that Elimelech and Naomi and their two sons lived in back when there was a famine. And Elimelech got out of Dodge, right? Boaz stayed. Boaz stayed and remained faithful in the midst of a culture that was breaking down around him. Does that sound familiar? He remained faithful in the midst of this time when Israel was in this cycle of sin and rebellion, judgment and consequence, repentance and deliverance. When people weren't following the Lord, and we know that Boaz was obedient to God, he not only knew the Lord's commands, but he followed them. He allowed people to glean in his field. And his workers even knew he was obedient. See, Ruth didn't come to Boaz and ask permission and get permission. She went to his workers, and they knew who Boaz was. They knew he was an obedient man who followed the law of the Lord and allowed people to glean. We also see that he's a godly man, and he's obedient in his kindness, in his words to his workers. Right When he shows up, he blesses them. Boaz isn't putting it on for the camera. This is who Boaz is. See, Boaz was faithful in his obedience because of God's faithful love. Next, we see the kindness of Boaz. Once again, when he shows up, he blesses his, his workers, right? He blesses them. We see him bless Ruth. We see the words of Boaz just laced with God, with this love of God for him. You see, how a man treats those under his authority tells you, tells you a lot about that man. Boaz, so far, is living up to everything we know about him. He is a worthy man. Now, the picture I get of this scene is uh, Boaz kind of rolls up in his old beater farm truck. It's a blue truck, just so you know. Um, It's an old beater farm truck, and when he gets out, he's got his overalls on, he's got his white t-shirt on, he's got his beat-up old straw hat, comes up to his foreman, hey, the Lord be with you. And then he looks up, and he sees a woman he doesn't recognize, and he immediately inquires about her. And the question he asks in verse 5 is is very specific. See, he doesn't ask, what's her name? He doesn't ask who she is. He says in verse 5, whose young woman is this? You see, this was a time in Israel that was wicked. Go and read Judges 19. You'll get it. Trust me. This was a time in Israel that was wicked. And so a, a foreigner in a field by herself with no protection would have been in great danger. Boaz knows this. And so what Boaz is asking when he asks, whose young woman is this? He's really asking, whose protection is she under? Does this woman, gleaning in my field, have protection? And what he finds out is something of even more interest than he thought. He finds out that she is the woman who came back with Naomi from Moab. This is Ruth the Moabite. And so she has come back, and he sees that this is a foreigner working in his field, an outsider who doesn't know the land, doesn't know the people, and she has no protection. And so this story had to have tugged on Boaz's heartstrings. It had to. If you were here for our Joshua series, we met a woman named Rahab, who was a prostitute in the city of Jericho. And the story of Rahab is that she hides the spies. Her real story is she comes to truth, in the, she comes to faith in the one true God, and then comes for refuge with his people. This woman was Boaz's mother. So Boaz knows this story. This is not a foreign story to him. Because Ruth is a woman who has come to faith in the one true God and come for refuge to his people. And so Boaz sees that. And then verse 8, we see he takes action. He has has learned of her character. 
He's learned of her humility. He's learned that she's a hard worker. He's learned that something is driving her. This love of Yahweh for her is driving her. And so Boaz takes action. He gently but firmly reaches out and commands her. And pay close attention to the commands that he gives her. Paul Miller, in his book, A Loving Life, identifies seven commands from Boaz to Ruth. Um, Do not glean in another field. This is verses 8 and 9. Do not glean in another field. Do not leave this one. Keep close to my young women. Let your eyes be on the field that they are reaping. Go after them. Have I not charged the young men not to touch you? When you are thirsty, go to the vessels and drink. Did you catch that he didn't trust the young men? All the fathers of daughters say amen, right? Yeah, I have a daughter now, so I can, I'm with you on that one. Um, so uh, Boaz is saying with these commands, you know, he, he could have said to her, you know, I think it's great that you're here. You know, go ahead, pick up what you can get. That's fine. You know, do your thing. He could have done that. But that's not Boaz. There's a greater kindness in this man driven by the love of his God. And so he welcomes her. He not only welcomes her, but he says, you will be protected in my field. You are now under my protection. Don't go to another field. There is protection for you here. This validates all that we know of Boaz so far. Boaz didn't have to do this. He was an obedient man. He followed the laws of the Lord and was required to allow her to glean. But he was in no way required to show her protection. Boaz is a worthy man. And he stands faithful. Boaz is generous and kind and godly in a ferocious way. You see, Boaz was faithful in his kindness because of God's faithful love. And, and just when you think Boaz had gone too far, he kind of hits ludicrous speed in his generosity, right? He goes plaid on Ruth, right? And in, in verse, so some of you got that, right? A little, yeah, okay. All right, so uh, what we see is in verse 14, he invites her to lunch. Right, Boaz has come and he's provided lunch for his workers. And this woman who is an outsider, who is a foreigner, who knows nothing, and he invites her into the community of his people. And so in this act, he is telling them, not only, he's not only telling her that she's welcome and protected, he is telling them and reiterating to them that she is welcome and protected in my field. And then he goes even further and he serves her. Now, this is nuts. Right? In this day and age, a man serving a woman was one thing, but a man serving a foreign woman, completely different. Right? This is crazy, but this is Boaz. His generosity overflows because it's driven by the love of his God for him. And so Ruth eats. She gets up, goes back to work. Makes sense, what we know of Ruth. After she works, Boaz continues. like He's not done yet, right? So he says to his workers, not only are you not to touch her, but you need to help her. Right? Pull out some of the stalks that you've cut down. Give her some of your labors. Help her out. Boaz is, is telling, is being generous, overly, overly generous. And this is all, once again, this is, this is the chesed of God flowing through Boaz into Ruth. Through his generosity. You see, Boaz was faithful in his generosity because of God's faithful love. So what we have here is two people who came together not because they were looking for each other, but because God had scripted their story that way. God had brought them together. So we have Ruth, who's driven by the love of God for her, guided by the hand of God before her, and protected by the wings of God over her, finds favor in Boaz. And Ruth, a woman who has initiative, and humility and determination, not driven by personal gain, but only by the love of her God, meets Boaz. And in Boaz, we see a man, a follower of Yahweh. And he enters the space of Ruth, and he brings with him his faithfulness and his obedience and his kindness and in his generosity. And what we get to see is the love of God flowing through these two people as they come together, burst into Naomi, and bust up all that bitterness. And so we come to Naomi. And so Ruth comes home from a hard day's work, right? She brings with her like massive amounts of food. Like this is like Super Bowl party food, right? She brings all this food with her, okay? And, and Naomi responds. 
Because Ruth has brought with her more than just physical, something to feed them physically. She has brought with her a glimmer of hope. I don't think Ruth recognizes it yet, but Naomi gets it. All right? This blessing of God through Ruth has now gotten to Naomi. And even though she was bitter, she's now reaping this from the Lord. Right? And, it, and it, it busts her up, man. This bitterness, it just begins to flow out of her in blessing. Like she's blessing all kinds of people in this chapter. Right? She's blessing Boaz. She's blessing the Lord. She's, she's just overflowing because of what has happened. And it's all driven, once again, by the faithful love of her God. But she also recognized something else. She knows who Boaz is. She knows that he is of the clan of Elimelech. And so she recognizes that this hope that she has now is from God. The Lord who has shown his favor, shown his kindness, his loving kindness, that is the word said, on not only the living, Ruth and Naomi, but on the dead, Elimelech and her two sons. The Lord has provided for them a redeemer. And so Naomi begins to develop a plan. And we see that in chapter 3. You've got to come back next week and check that out. I'm telling you, it's scandalous scandalous. <laughs> so we have in Ruth and Boaz, once again, two people um, who are brought together, and I gotta say, um, they probably wouldn't have scripted their stories that way. But in spite of it, they remained faithful. So three things to take away. Not three. Three things, not two. Three things to take away. What we see in Boaz and Ruth is that they realized this was not their story to script. You see, Ruth had committed to Naomi because she was overwhelmed by this love of God for her. And so she came to each day with an open hand, allowing God to lead her into greater joy. In Boaz, we see a follower of Yahweh when the culture around him is breaking down, right? Sin and repentance, There's sin and rebellion, judgment and consequence, repentance and deliverance. This is the cycle they're in. That people around Boaz are not following the Lord. Or we wouldn't see this context. So Bo- Boaz is not taken in by this. Boaz stands faithful. He knew God was in the lead of his life. And so he also came every day with an open hand. God, what do you want from me today? God, your love is driving me. So I have to ask, what about us? Right? Right? What about us? Do we have an open hand to God for our journey? Do we recognize that God is leading us in better places than we could ever lead our, leave ourselves? Or do we have our hands so tightly gripped around the control of our lives that our knuckles are white? You see, things go really well, right? When we're in control, like we're happy, we're comfortable, and then things go poorly and we get mad and upset. Great cycle, right? But when we come to each day with an open hand to the Lord for what he wants to do in our lives, he will lead us into greater joy and into life abundant. Does that mean our life will be easy? No. Does it mean our life will be happy? No. But does it mean that we will be found faithful before a God who loves us even more than we love ourselves? I would say yes. See, we can faithfully let go of control because of God's faithful love. Second thing, faithfulness is not stagnant. Boaz and Ruth are faithful, but they are not stagnant. They are taking action. They are moving. They get going. They work hard. You see, they have to move because God is on the move. Jesus is on mission. Proverbs 16, 9 doesn't say that a man sits around and the Lord does everything. That's not what it says. There is action to be taken. Now, oftentimes we want blessing with no work. I have to say that God doesn't bless us because we work hard. And God doesn't bless us because we deserve it. But as we stand faithful to him because of his love, he can bless us because it brings him greater glory. And sometimes, blessing looks like six or seven weeks of 12-hour days picking up scraps just so we can eat. You see, we can faithfully act because of God's faithful love. And finally, in Ruth and Boaz, we, we do see two people, very good examples of faithfulness. But I will say with great confidence that at some point they botched it. 
some point they blew it. Right? They weren't perfect people. They were still sinners in need of grace. But I also say with great confidence that there was one who was perfectly faithful. He came and he was perfect in his obedience to the Father. He came and showed initiative. He showed humility. He showed determination. He showed obedience, kindness, and overflowing generosity to us. And that man was Jesus. You see, he came and lived the life that we should have lived, right? In perfect obedience to the Father. And the blessing he got for it was to die on the cross. A horrific death for our sins. You see, all of us are a little bit like Ruth, right? Sin makes us poor and hopeless. But just like Boaz entered into the story of Ruth because of God's faithful love for both of them and provided hope, Jesus enters into our story and provides us hope eternal. God is directing our story, whether we want to admit it or not. God is directing our story, and as Jesus comes into that story, he brings hope. I would say if you're here this morning and you haven't yet experienced this faithful love of God for you, through faith in his son, Jesus Christ, I say with great confidence that you are not here by accident. God is calling to you. God is wooing you to himself. What God is saying to you is stay in my field. Stay here with me. You're protected. I will provide for you here. Don't go to another field. See, because of what Jesus did, we have the opportunity to be found faithful because of his faithful love. And so if you'd like to hear more about this, if you felt the Lord calling to you this morning, we will have people up here after the service to pray for you, pray with you. We would love to have that conversation with you. Remember, we can be faithful because of God's faithful love. Let's pray.